welcome to It's All Relative. I'm Josh. And I'm Timothy. What's good? And this is episode eight. Episode eight. Episode eight. Uh, what's going on, my man? Doing well, brother. Doing well. Just relaxing. Nice. It's been a tiring day as usual. Yeah. How was, how was this past week for you? You know what? It's been all over the place with all things considered. Yeah. It's been all over the place, but uh, it's been pretty good. Nice. Yeah, aside from, you know, obvious things that are happening. Right. Um, We can touch on that real quick. I wanted to, uh, because I did want to maybe quickly address some of the events that took place this past Wednesday, which mm-hmm. was uh, January 6, 2021. Oh, yeah. Day to be remembered forever. Right. Um, Trump supporters broke in or entered the Capitol building in D.C. They broke in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. All right, what are your thoughts on this whole mess? Man, what- I have some thoughts on it. So a lot of it is is pure craziness, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, I honestly think that, me personally, I think that they're traitors for doing what they did. Because The reason why, I know they, they're saying that they're you know fighting for their rights and everything, but mm-hmm. they quickly dismiss the fact that that's a sacred building. You know, mm-hmm. that's sacred halls where, you know, laws are being made and laws are being voted and judged upon and everything. And if you do say that you're a patriot, you should know stuff like that. And you should know, you know, how sacred that process is, despite if you like it or if you don't like it, you know, not everybody gets to win all the time. You know what I mean? But that's a process that keeps the country solid that that's what makes our republic what a republic is right so if you're willing to break in and try to like stop that process because your guy didn't win that's a problem right that almost seems like when when you lay it out like that it almost seems and sounds um childish yeah <laughs> you it know is childish. like yeah you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah I'm- you're the person that you wanted to win didn't win so you're basically you know what right you know, Throw a temper tantrum. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, much. Pretty much. Pretty much. Did you see some of the um, photos that were taken or any of the videos? Of- I saw many of those photos and videos, bro. Yeah, some of them were really wild, right? Like, yeah. um, let's see. I saw photos of, of a guy... Uh, Walking out with a podium, with the po- yeah, and yeah. that was the speaker of the house's uh, Nancy Pelosi's podium. See, he wow. scooped the podium and ran out. I do think, though, I did see today that um he since then he he has been arrested. Yeah. There there have been some arrests made oh, yeah. and whatnot. I saw a picture of some guy um totally dressed up like GI Joe had the whole yeah gear the whole on, nine and gear yeah had um zip ties actually did right, you see right. the picture to, the to like arrest those the ones that the uh police officers use yeah, yeah like and i did hear that there was actually um like some form of an explosive that was found yes yeah, so a whole truck full of explosive and see that's I, we didn't even touch on that so there's that too yeah it's I, no longer lawful protest you know what i mean well okay um i'm glad that you said that because uh i wanted to get your opinion what did you think that those events were, uh, would you consider it a protest or was it a riot? Okay, so to be very, very honest, it was both. The reason why I say it was both, I'm not going to sit here and say because people broke into the Capitol mm-hmm. and actually smashed windows in and mm-hmm. you know got into it with the Capitol Police that there weren't people that were being lawful. There were people being lawful outside and they were also protesting. They were standing out like they were supposed to, mm-hmm. you know, and protesting like it, like they were supposed to. And then there were the couple of people that wanted to, you know, go in, smash up everything and destroy stuff and, you know, take property. I mean, if you see some of the some of the videos mm-hmm. or, or listen to some of the video, they wanted to hang Mike Pence. They really? said hang Mike Pence. They were chanting it. That's you know, wild. they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. They were chanting, like, where's Nancy Pelosi? You know, so all, already right there, it's not even a political thing. They're just tired of the system. But you don't destroy, you don't destroy the hallowed halls to try and make a point. Right. You Abs- know what I mean? Absolutely. And then take selfies or smoke weed inside of the Capitol. Come <laughs> on. Yeah. yeah, there were a lot of uh, selfies being taken. Right. Um, you saw, I saw a picture of some dude... Um, Kicking it, actually, I think on uh, Nancy's uh, desk. De- yeah. yeah, and they caught him too. Up. Yep. Yeah. Um. What else? I saw somebody. I think that had um some of her mail. 
exact same guy actually oh really was yeah, it okay yeah, so yeah um i'm trying to just he did uh, leave a quarter though he said that he paid for it oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah yeah that's what he said very um strange i did see like some of the videos that i remember seeing um these people taking the metal gates that they usually use as barriers to block right. people away they were leaning them against the building and climbing right the and climbing walls. the wall scaling the wall wild yeah it made me think because um okay so there were cops there okay there um, there definitely were cops yeah but I feel like um in my opinion it seemed like things were handled oddly you oh, know oh come um, on yeah for sure I saw videos of of cops basically just stepping aside and yeah. letting and swinging the door and open. letting people just Run walk right in, in yeah, you know right um, which is crazy uh, to me because once again, um, this is the Capitol building. Had, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like it's supposed to be the most protected building in the United States, right. or one of them. And you basically just stepping back and kind of, I mean, not putting up much force and resistance, right. and where, just letting them through. Where, as if we rewind it to go back a few months ago to the um, when the Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter, Matter yeah, right. was going on. You know, a lot of those protests or riots or however you want to base it on, mm-hmm. those situations were handled much differently. Oh, yeah. They um, were deep with the soldiers. Violence yeah, for with real. force. So, yeah. uh, come on. You know, like, it was handled very differently. It was. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was. I do think, I mean, and like I said, this is just my opinion, but... um. The Trump supporters and whatnot, mm-hmm. the people that had gone into the building, um, I do agree with the statement that was said. Um, if it was, if it was any other, like you know, yeah, uh, if it was Black Lives Matter or it, anybody yeah, else, if it was, if yeah. you know, if it was a different group or a race people. group yes. of people doing the same thing and you know, storming through the buildings and whatnot. The whole situation would have been handled completely different. De- definitely, you know? definitely, and it's actually it's actually kind of ironic that you say that because it still shows the systemic racism that exists. Absolutely. Because let's not even say let's say that it's not even racist. Mm-hmm. The idea that they probably thought that these guys that were protesters because that they're white, they probably thought, oh, maybe they won't do something like break into the capital maybe they won't be like unruly so already right there they probably didn't even have as much of a police presence Mm -hmm. because they didn't have a reason to think that oh they would do anything you know because they're white versus oh if they're black or if they're colored oh yeah they may you know you know you're already in that mindset that oh they're going to start some stuff Mm -hmm. and there is there is a little bit of uh, truth in that but Let's see what, like, I've never seen Black Lives Matter break into the Capitol. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. And right. they protest at the Capitol. They protest at the White House, and they've never done stuff like this. They've never organized behind the scenes to break into the Capitol. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it is what it is. It is what it is. It was a wild, um, wild event. Definitely a crazy thing in history. It was uh, we made sure. it. We made it six days in. We made it six days in, <laughs> and that already happened. Yeah, six days in, <laughs> oh and then my God. some wild situation happened. But um, it is what it is, man. Yeah. Any other top news stories you want to cover? Top Any news headlines? stories. Anything? Finally got back to AEW. My man. Yeah, man. So my still, man. still trying to figure out who I like or who I don't like. And uh, caught the the most amazing jump from Snoop Dogg I've ever seen in my life <laughs> from a top rope. <laughs> yes, shout out. So I guess we can say that um, to shed some light then on on Wednesday because AEW this past Wednesday night, uh-huh. and so um, all those events that happened during the day right. were a negative thing. And then yes, you you're absolutely correct that uh, Wednesday night uh, on AEW Snoop Dogg. Well, it was on, and the world got to see him do a do a splash off the top rope. <laughs> That's a hell of a splash, bro. Can you and even call was, that a splash? I don't know. It I was, was like, don't fall. It was hilarious. It was definitely hilarious. You know, I would tell everybody that I, I'm sure everyone, a lot of people have seen it because it became like the next day. It's been all over. There's right. been memes yeah, made up right. of it. Snoop Dogg's embracing the memes. He's like, yeah, I still did a great job. What of it? But it was funny. Yeah. 
definitely actually I remember, you know, watching it and and just dying out laughing when it happened. So yeah. since I that was the episode I for me that I caught. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story behind that. Was that just was he just like written in just for that moment? Yeah, cuz he was there. Yeah, it wasn't he he's not part of, you know, the regular programming or anything of AEW. Oh, okay, so, so he, it was he just didn't have like special. no background. It actually I think because him and Cody Rhodes um because he came out with Cody Rhodes, they are judges or whatnot of a new TV show. Oh, that, that's pretty um, cool. So it's cross promotion. Yeah, I feel like they just yeah, brought him on for sure. to be a little part of it and gave him a little spot to try to shine. Right, right, right. He definitely shined, boy. <laughs> he did that little splash. That little splash. Like, bro, don't fall off of those ropes, man. What are yeah. you doing? You're like 50 years old. Get off the ropes. <laughs> Get off the ropes, uncle. Yeah, but um, but definitely shout out to AEW. Shout out to AEW. Tune in every Wednesday night. Yes, sir. All right, my man. Let's get in a little to today's episode. All right, let's um, get to it. Today we're going to be focusing or giving our uh, our hometown a little shine. Okay. You know, when people hear or think of Poughkeepsie, there's one name that often gets brought up. And that name happens to be Snooky. Snooky. From Jersey Shore. Lord have mercy. Are you familiar with the uh, show? Definitely familiar. Did you ever get into it? <laughs> Begrudgingly, yeah. I mean, yeah. hey, that's you can, a silly show. You can man. be honest, bro, uh, because for me too, I really, I was definitely into Jersey Shore. You were definitely into it. I watched for good or for bad, because I, I love to hate it. No, um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was funny, like it was uh, like anything else. But then I did get sucked into it, oh, and I, yeah, I watched. Dude. Yeah, I think um, I don't even remember how many seasons they have, because I think they're still doing they're stuff. Still doing it, yeah. But like now, I don't really pay too much attention to it but mm -hmm. um i did at least for the first what four or five seasons whatnot um mm -hmm. damn you, bro, you were five seasons deep into that i think i put like two in there and i yeah, was like no, right, I, I was a fan bro yeah, I, yeah. Like hey, I, said, I, was, I mean it's it was worth it the storyline was there though so i was a fan the weird thing though about that is because um i guess it's more of a generational thing definitely um so the you know people now do associate um, Poughkeepsie, or, or when they hear of it, I guess they do think of Snooky because um, mm -hmm. that's where they had said, you know, in the show, that was her hometown. That was her hometown and everything. But in all reality, um, she was really from Marlboro. Yeah. She oh, she's from, from Marlboro? Oh, yeah, she you went from I, no I knew, um, what's it called? I know somebody that went to uh, high school with her. They were on the same cheerleading squad. Oh, wow. Oh, so, so she is a cheerleader then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She, okay. And like I said, and her father is a, or was, mm -hmm. you know, was a firefighter okay yeah like everything like most everything that they had said you know was legit and whatnot except that um I, maybe they said poughkeepsie was uh because um it's close and it's more it's close, yeah. of you know it's noticeable right 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 more than marlboro right definitely more than marlboro yeah but like, um shout outs to snooki yeah shout out to snooki <laughs> you know for people though who uh who are a little older that don't you know before Snooky and whatnot. Way before. Yeah. Uh, people who were around this area in the late 80s and 90s, yeah, they recall another name or event that rocked Poughkeepsie that ended in unimaginable occurrences, leaving people feeling in awe. And that man's name, the person who was responsible for all that, was Kendall Francois. Kendall Francois. Yes, Kendall Francois. And a name that'll live in infamy. Yeah. It's kind of crazy because uh, a lot of people are familiar now, you know, more so than um, than not. But people are familiar with this man's name and, and the story. Yeah, the it's, story is something else. Right. The story is wild because um, it's crazy because it did happen. It's a true life story. And like I said, it happened right here in our hometown. Right. Do they have a so, movie based on this story? Um, or like video or anything? There's a movie. Okay, so there's a movie that came out, um, and it's called The Poughkeepsie Tapes. Poughkeepsie Tapes, okay. And it basically shows like some crazy dude who abducts women and, um, you know, does crazy stuff to them and, and kills them and whatnot. And then people thought that, um, that that movie was based off because that came out right around the time as all this as, right. as this story. So a lot of people thought that um, they had something to do with each other, you know. Okay, like yeah, they thought it was in tandem. Right. right, but I don't think that 
they did. Right. You it was just a it was a, just a coincidence right, pretty right. much. But similar, you know? Yeah. Similar similar things that happened, which is weird. Anyway. Let's get to let's it. Let's get a little background info on uh on this man that they called Kendall Francois. So he was born July 26, 1971. During 1996 and 1998, he had killed eight women. Eight women? Eight women, giving him the nickname of the Poughkeepsie Killer or Stinky. After he was convicted and sentenced to life without parole, he was housed in the Attica Correctional Facility until being transferred to the Windy Correctional Facility shortly before his death. All right. In his trial in 2000, okay, Mm -hmm. um, it was revealed that he had tested positive for HIV back in 1995. Okay. But, But that didn't have anything to do with his death. Okay. Um... Heart attack? Uh, well, he died in Windy Correctional on September 11th, 2014, okay. at the age of 43, of apparent natural causes. Okay, so heart attack or something like that. Something, yeah. It had been rumored, though, that the reason why Kendall Francois had killed um, all these women was because that he had contracted HIV from one of them. So... That was the reasoning. So like an act of revenge? Or motivation, correct, behind the murders. Which makes sense, I guess, you know. I can understand, I guess, if if that had happened. If it happened, right? You're just going to take it out on them. Yeah. But, like I said, um, that was just a rumor. Because that was nothing that he had ever said. He had never um, stated, really, why he had done that, I don't believe. So he took it to the grave with him. Yeah. Yeah. Which is... uh, Unfortunate, but that's the mind of those uh, of the serial killers. You know, you never know. Yeah, you, ne- you uh, never really yeah. know the motivation. All right, let's go back. Okay. Let's, let's go back to October 24th, 1996. All right. Okay. 1996. Wendy Myers. She was reported missing, all right, mm-hmm. by her boyfriend, she had been missing for two days, and he had filed a missing persons report. Okay. And that was that. All right. So I guess we can say that this this whole thing started around October. Okay. okay? So. Right. Um, jumping forward a little bit, though. All right. Now let's jump to the 9th of December. All okay. right. Still 1996. So just, right. just a few months. A few months up. A few yeah. months. All right. A lady named Patricia Barone filed a missing persons report on her 28-year-old daughter named Gina. Okay. Now, Gina was a known prostitute and drug user uh, Uh, around the area. Right. Okay. Patricia said that her daughter uh, was dating a guy named Richie at the time. Richie? Yeah, Richie. Okay. So, she goes on to say that Gina and her boyfriend, they got into a fight. Okay. She told him to leave. Um, when she told him to leave, he did. All right. Hours later, though, he came back to the area that they were at, and mm. Gina was gone. And oh, she was just gone. For, how she long was ago? no longer there. Was it like after thirty minutes or an hour? Uh, does it say a, a few hours? Okay. So, few hours. so they got in a fight. Um, you know, she told him to leave, so he took off, okay. and then came back a few hours later to the same area, and she wasn't and there. She wasn't there. Damn. So. A week later, Richie shows up to Patricia's house, all right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he's saying, you know, I can't find Gina anywhere. And Patricia thought that that was uh, strange because Gina always was around. Right. She It was said that she never really went anywhere because she always did the same thing. Right, right, right. So So she had a routine. Correct, exactly. And um and she didn't go anywhere. She you know, so mm-hmm. she was always in the same areas. The same so she spots she wouldn't doing have been things. wouldn't have been hard to find. Right, right, right. I wanna give a little background information real quick or a little uh side note about Gina Barone. Um one of our guests that we had, had on okay. earlier in uh one of our earlier episodes, this person's mother um knew Gina. Oh, okay. Y- yes. Um, they worked at a computer factory together between uh, 1987 and 1989. Okay, there's a connection. 
Yes. Um, that was back in 93 was when um, Gina got into the uh, prostitution world ah, see, and started using drugs and whatnot. But, um, and then I guess that this person, that's when they had lost touch. Right. You know. Man, I, I wonder I wonder how she's feeling then to to have seen this happen. Yeah, um I'm sure you she know, was probably upset. Um Yeah, it has to have been. Lots of different emotions and It's whatnot. unfortunate. Yeah. All right, so these events have taken place. Mm -hmm. So now the cops are going to get involved obviously, right. you know. Cuz we're on woman 2 now, aren't we? Yes, this is the second person All that's right. been uh reported missing. missing. All right. So, Carl Skipmanane was the man, um, or the detective, who got Gina's case, mm -hmm. all right? So, he scooped up Richie, you know, he wanted to question her, and that was, remember, Gina's boyfriend at the time. Mm -hmm. But after questioning him and going through, um, you know, certain things, uh, it was decided that he wasn't a suspect. Okay. Okay. So a month after Gina's disappearance, the Poughkeepsie Police Department, they get a new chief detective, all okay. right? And his name was Bill Segrist. And Segrist. Okay. Yeah, and now him and Detective Manane were going to be on this case together. So they're trying to chase after because, what, there are two uh, missing two, two people. Two missing people missing, yeah. Correct. So, so did they just replace the other guy? Was the other guy not good enough, or did they just get this guy? No, the original guy, he's still part of it. He's on oh, the okay. case. He's, he's on the case as yeah, well. Yeah, he's okay. with him. So police resources, though, at the time were limited because, um, you know, the two people who are missing, they're prostitutes. Right, so right. So looked at or considered as almost second-class citizens. Right, you know? right, right. So they're not very high on the priority list. Right, they're not putting that, man, that much... Uh, I guess priority on them, yeah. Yeah, which is not much resources, yeah. Right. So now we move on to January fifteenth, nineteen ninety seven. Okay. So uh like a month. A month. Like a month goes okay. on. And the police get report of another missing woman. Her name is Kathleen Hurley. Okay. All right, and she now was the third missing person. She was known to hang out and take part in the same activities okay. as, as Gina and Wendy, the so first two. So she was two. a prostitute as well? Correct. Was it from the same area as well? Same area. Damn. Yes. So now there's starting to be um, some form of, you know, uh, routine. Right. All three ladies have been picked up or missing around the same, same area. area. Now, so, it, was it at the same times as well? That I don't think they know yet. Okay. So all they know is that um, there's a general area and women seem to be... Just getting get, scooped up. Yeah. <laughs> get, yeah. My goodness. So, but unfortunately at this time, there's still no suspects. Okay. Okay. And all the police know at this moment is that there's three prostitutes missing. Mm -hmm. No crime scenes, no witnesses. Damn. So the cops then decide that um, maybe it's smart that they start to interview uh, maybe some of the other prostitutes on the street, you know, mm -hmm. asking if they know anything or, you know, if they had any bad encounters with anyone recently. Right. Um, a few women mentioned the same name. All right. And the name that the cops got was a 26-year-old Kendall Francois. Okay. So his name already started appearing on like their ledger and everything. Right. I guess he was causing some issues. Right. You know, so you know, these women remember. Yeah, they definitely do. <laughs> you know. For sure. So Kendall Francois was a big dude though. Um he was six four, three hundred plus pounds. Okay, um, damn. Closer I guess it was closer to almost the four hundred, but three hundred plus for sure. He had terrible uh body odor. I guess, to himself. And his hygiene wasn't good. You right, know? right. So um, I guess the cops start to get info, as much info as they can, mm -hmm. on Kendall. They find out that he lives with his mother and father and sister. Jesus. Okay. He works at a middle school that um is still open now to yeah, this day. To this day, yeah. yeah. And at night, he'd go out and pick up prostitutes. 
So, I mean, that was his schedule. That was his life. You know, they didn't get, so the cops didn't get too much information, but they get a a good summary. Right. You know, they get a nice uh, tidbit to go off of. Right. And, and somewhat maybe a, a little routine mm-hmm. of his so they can get an idea of what he's all about. So, two more months go by. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, March 7th now, 1997. Okay. Catherine Marsh is reported missing by her mother. All right. And you said this was in March. Correct. Okay. Kathleen Marsh. Yes. All right. Um, she was last seen November twelfth, four months prior. Jesus. So it took yeah, which uh so yeah, it took that's some lag. Four months, right? Yeah. Before someone or her own mother reported her missing. But my God. I mean, yeah, that was a long time. Is it possible that she was already taken and killed by that time, like around with the uh, the second one? Quite possible. Um, cause, Definitely possible. You know, yeah, you never know the uh, the timetable of when right. these uh, when they were. This is just a missing killed. It, it's just missing. Wow. Yeah, which it could be too. Um, you know, since these women were prostitutes, that um, it was probably normal for you know, their mothers or whatnot, not to hear from them for long periods of time. Right, right, long so, stretch of so time. So maybe that four months, it seems like a long time. To That's not, a hell of a long time, though, still. To not file a missing persons act. Right. But maybe her mother was just used to her going out and doing her thing for so long mm-hmm. and figured maybe eventually she'd get in touch with me, you know. Right, right. But then she would after, do something. After being four months and whatnot, then, you know, time to call. It's It's, it's time to concern, call it in. Right. 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 So the cops decide and realize now that they weren't looking for missing women anymore because um, you're already at four, right? right? We're at four. Like you were saying. Right. So now not focusing on missing women, but they should start to focus for bodies. Dead bodies. Wow. Yeah, that sucks. That's unfortunate. Yeah. So what they do is they get an aerial search looking over spots where the prostitutes would take their dates. Okay. You know, the cops, they also searched the Hudson River shoreline and railroads, and they found nothing. Nothing, okay. Nothing. So, months have gone by, and still no progress. Wow. So, now we move to autumn. All right, so... Um, so, we're like into August, we, September? Yeah, yeah. So, a few more months mm-hmm. go by again, and now... There were two more prostitutes that were reported missing. So now we're up to six. Okay. All right. Were they reported at the same time? Um, I believe so, but I'm not. I'm not too sure. I just know that it had stated that um, come by the time autumn had hit, right? There were two more prostitutes that were reported missing. So. Okay. Okay. So. In December, or finally in December, 1997, the Poughkeepsie Journal publishes the story for people to know what's going on. Wow. And the headline read, Is There a Killer on the Loose? So it took almost a a full year year. before the public was really, you know, let on to what was going on, or maybe before the situation got serious enough or where they thought... That's, that's kind of crazy. Could you imagine, like, they would also have to report that it was a year. So mm-hmm. could right. you imagine them reporting, like, oh, yeah, for a year, women have just been getting snatched up, you know what I mean, from this area here, possibly? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, you, you got to wonder then who, who's to blame for that. Yeah, why, would it, why, why would it take a year right. to be able to get this information out there for people to for know? For sure. Like, you want to know, like, what's your age? You know, the age range of the people being snatched up? Is this a person that snatches up kids or what? Right. Yeah. yeah. People need the info. They need man. that. Yeah. So, yeah, like we said, the paper was published um, about a year mm-hmm. after. Um. So, Patricia Barone, Gina's mother, you know, she had stated that um, she always wondered that if Gina was dead or alive. And yeah, yeah and, and if she was alive, was she being held somewhere? You know, and, and that thought in itself scared her more than, than her being dead. Oof. You know, which Can makes. Can only imagine. Yeah, which makes sense. And, and I kind of agree with that too, because if you have a loved one that is missing, mm-hmm. 
you know, you don't, it would be horrible to think of like, you know, if they're still alive and being held and against be, their will. Right. Like, it would be what, freaking crazy. Yeah. Like the, the things that could go on in your mind could I, drive you crazy. I, you I can only imagine. Yeah. Like, I don't even want to think about it. It's just awful. I'm trying to think about it. It's right. just awful. And then the other end of that, which is still horrible, is then, you know, then you think like, well, well she's dead. Well, she's or, dead. Right. Is she dead? Right. And then you almost think like, oh my God, I... I between those two, you almost wish that she was, was because dead, right. she a sense have of calm. to go through right. Mm -hmm. But um, still to not know that would like not knowing either way would drive you crazy, right? You know, especially being a mother. I couldn't Oof. know. Man, I don't know. I wish I don't wish that on anybody, man. Right, it's awful. So let's move on then to January eighteenth now, nineteen ninety eight. Okay. The Cops have still, you know, so they've put together a little sketch now of Kendall Francois, a little file. Okay. You know. Do they have like his, how he looks, his uh, face and everything by then? Um. Yes. Th yeah. They're familiar of what he looks like. They're familiar with, you know, like I had said, with, with the things that he does. Right. His routine. His routine. Correct. Gotcha. So January 18th, 1998, All the right. cops follow Kendall Francois and his mother. Oh, yeah. He's t they're tailing okay. him. Okay. Yeah. They're in undercover cars. Mm -hmm. um, Kendall Francois drops his mother off, you know, at work. Mm -hmm. um, once she's out of the car, the cops then pull Kendall Francois over, um, ask him if he wants to come down to the station and answer some questions. Okay. And Kendall Francois agrees. So, he agrees. He agrees. Oh, he just says, all right, I'll go with you. Yeah. No, wow. Um, no issues, no complaints. Just, um, I don't even think he asked why they wow. pulled him over or whatnot. He was just agreeing with everything. Jesus. <laughs> you know? And he, he ran tests, didn't they? Yeah. So, so they, uh, he comes into the station, uh, he gets interviewed. Um, they said wow. that, um, he stayed completely calm and collected. Um, they also said he was respectful, and he even agreed to take a polygraph test. What? He pa did he pass the test? Um, he does. He, he ends up later on. He takes a polygraph. You're test freaking and kidding! Passes. Yeah, which is crazy. That's like no. That's no Mari nonsense, man. Right? The man actually passed it because he's a psycho. Right. The, he's a psychopath. The minds of a psychopath. The craziness. Wow. Yeah. So the cops didn't have enough evidence really for for a search warrant or anything. Okay. Um, so they somehow convinced Kendall Francois to take them to his house. So what? and and how they did that was there were reports that um you know Kendall Francois sometimes would get um rough with women oh, and oh, um beat him. And yeah, okay. and one of the women said that he pulled a knife oh. on her uh at one point. So um, it was never a filed police report or anything. This was just word of mouth from what one of the prostitutes had told um, right. one of the cops. Right. So the cops, though, had used that and had, had brought that up and, and mentioned it to Kendall. Mm -hmm. And they had said, um, you know, what about the knife that you used? To, and then he got a little, um, not upset, but he said, well, it wasn't a knife. It was a nail file. Wow. So he's kind of, you know. The yeah, audacity. He's playing into it. Right. So they get, um, so with that being said, that's how they get, they are in, able they go to in. use, yeah, right. to get, be able to get into the house because then they're like, well, you know, why don't you just show us the nail file and then this all will be good. Right. You know, so then. So wait, did he get played into having them come in? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. Exactly. He ain't that smart then. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's yeah. weird, right? Some, yeah. some. Some things you're very, very smart Very about. sharp on, <laughs> right. Passing others. a polygraph. Okay. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, okay, on arrival of the house, mm -hmm. Kendall Francois says that he's going to only allow one cop to follow him in, all right? Okay. And that cop happened to be Skip Manane. Okay, Skip okay? Manane. Yep. He was the, uh, remember, the original cop that had gotten the this whole case from the beginning. Right. All right. Okay, so when Manane walked into the building... He said that he was in shock of the condition of the house. All right. Okay. What's the condition like? <clears throat> no cabinet doors in the kitchen. What? <laughs> there was rotting food everywhere. Jesus All right. Christ. There were roaches. Um, the counters in the sinks were filled with dirty dishes. 
there were live maggots everywhere. Wow. And there was a layer of dead maggot shells throughout the room. Dead maggot shells. Yeah, so like when he was walking from room to room, he said that you could hear like the, the crunching. crunching of... That just, many? It's just filthy. All right, that's like, too much. Which I can't even, it's hard to imagine a yeah, house man. that is just so... I don't understand how someone could live like that. And bringing prostitutes there to, to, <laughs> to do things. Yeah, it's just absolutely... Um, oh, God. Filthy, filthy. Yeah, it is filthy. So, Manane said that uh, Kendall Francois wouldn't allow him in any rooms, right? Obviously. Besides besides his own, okay? Besides okay. Kendall Francois' room. Um. Wait, didn't allow him? He's a cop. Shouldn't the cop be able to like look wherever they want? Yes, but um, it's still they legally they they don't have a search warrant. Ah, so this is just so simply yeah. he's just kind of just like just waltzing in, right? Okay. And Kendall Francois just agreed to to bring him to his room. Well, he's a real so fool like for that. As, as he's bringing him to his room, the, right. the cops walking through and and seeing, and seeing the condition the of the house. So Jesus. that's what he's seeing. And that's you know he's walking. To Kendall Francois's room, stepping on all these maggot shows shows. themselves. Oh, God. And smelling the sights. Yeah. Jesus. Manane said that when they entered Kendall Francois's room, that um, the condition of that was worse than the house. That the uh, so the room was a step above. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus. There was rotting food and wow. garbage everywhere. Imagine. There's no way. That's just too uh, gross, man. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's filthy, like hoarders. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Just nasty. Just nasty. So they um, so they're in the room. Kendall Francois is looking for the nail file. Right. They're in the room. They're looking for the file. Um, and Nane's trying to, you know, do what cops do, just trying to look for low any, key, low any, key looking. Yeah. any clue, any kind right. of thing by not touching anything, you know? Right. Um, Kendall Francois doesn't end up finding the nail file and after a few minutes ends up getting a little spooked, you know, like, uh, or anxious. Right, like, right, right. Like, and starts to say, you know, um, we got to go, you know, we got to go. Uh, he had said that, you know, his, his father was going to be home soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to, you're not supposed to be in the house. We, we got to leave. How old is Kendall at this time? Uh, like I don't 20, 30? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Actually, I think, um, well, in the beginning, I think when this all started, it, it said that he was 26. 26. Okay. So yeah, so, I can see the 26 or 27. All right. So as they're exiting the house, mm-hmm. Manane is in front of Kendall Francois, okay. right? So they're they're going back downstairs. They're going back through the house to to exit, and Manane still wanted to figure out more. You know, this right. this could be the only time that, that they he gets could be to in the in house, there. right? So instead of heading out, I guess to the door to leave the house, he cut a quick corner to head down to the basement. Oh, okay. So he went a little bit above and beyond, right? He was trying to get Good down to him. the basement. As he starts to go down to the basement, Kendall Francois stops him and immediately oh, okay. is, is, you know, you cannot go, you can't go down there. We have to leave. So it definitely seemed like maybe he was hiding something, but at the same time, uh, he was definitely he was on anxious, edge. anxious and trying to get him out the house. Mm-hmm. So they end up leaving the house and Kendall Francois still agreed, you know, like we had said, he, he agreed to take a polygraph test. Okay. And like we had mentioned before, uh, he took the polygraph took test and, and he passed. passed. Jesus. Which is crazy. It's right? still crazy. Yeah. Uh, I think you got to be very smart um, and skilled to be able to yeah. pass a, uh, right, a pass polygraph, a polygraph right, test. Like you right? have to think yourself out of the anxiety. All right. Um, we're going to take a quick break. But before we do that, uh, we want to remind our listeners to please find us on Apple Spotify, YouTube, Anchor. Please continue to subscribe, follow, share, comment, hit that five star rating. Please bless us with the five stars. Please, please continue to support the podcast. Yes. It really, it really helps. And thank you. And and looking at the statistics, I have to say that you guys have really been watching, or not watching, but listening. And really, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It really, it really helps us and and supports us in the pod. And with that being said, uh, we'll be right back. All right. So I have a question for our listeners out there. Do you own a computer? 
Are you having trouble with broken screens, data backup issues, password reset problems, virus spyware removal, software installation issues? If so, Slipstream Repair Computer Electronic Solutions has you covered. Contact Timothy Latunde at 845-204-1712. The email is ss.sho16 at gmail.com. Once again, that is 845-204-1712. And the email is ss.sho16 at gmail.com. Call or email to schedule a free consultation. It's all relative. So we're continuing to break down this true life story about Kendall Francois, a.k.a. the Poughkeepsie Killer. The Poughkeepsie Killer. Didn't he have a nickname as well? Um, Yep. uh, Stinky. Stinky. Yep. So at this point of the story, um, do you have any thoughts about it, bro? I mean, it just seems like uh, he was just had a little bit too much audacity. You know what I mean? Like take the polygraph test i'll come in you know come on down and find the file yeah he's he's a little too open yeah but um him passing that polygraph test i, I feel like um that probably boosted his confidence right thinking, right like yo they they ain't gonna they ain't gonna find anything they, yeah because if you were able to do that then you know right you got some skill you need skill yeah. you bold enough to go on a wild goose chase <laughs> right yeah all right, so let's get back into it, my man. Let's go. All right, so the case is at a standstill. Okay, it's we've at gone, a standstill. We've gone months, or it's been a year, and um, still nothing. Still nothing. All right. The cops get word, though, that there's another possible suspect. Okay. Okay. Another and possible his, suspect. Right, and his name is Roy Chandler. Roy Chandler. Yes, Uh he had a deep criminal history, including assaults, a rape, and some connection with the murder of a woman. Okay. All right. He was from South Carolina. Hmm. Um, Poughkeepsie cops contacted law enforcement down in South Carolina. And to sum it up quickly, um, their response was that if you have women missing, then he could be a strong suspect. Okay, so, so they, they kind of had him in mind. Yeah, they're, okay. they're letting the Poughkeepsie cops know that, you know, it's a good bet. It's a good bet that, he's, that, that he's, he may be, yeah. Right. Okay. So, luckily, though, for the cops, uh, you know, when they're trying to hunt this dude down, he had already been arrested for patronizing a prostitute. Okay. So, he was already in the Poughkeepsie jail. <laughs> so, he, he was already in there, so right. one less suspect. Um, he was released, right? So the night he was released, Menane and Segris confronted him, right? And, okay. they, and they questioned him about all the uh, the missing prostitutes and whatnot. And he denied having anything to do with the missing prostitutes. Cops soon find out, though, that um, he hasn't been living in a house. Like, he has no, no okay, so address. Okay, so yeah, Right. Pretty much, yeah. He he was living in the woods in the surrounding areas of Poughkeepsie. All right, so it couldn't have been him, for sure. So, well, it could have been still, but it's just made things a little, uh, a little tougher. Okay. You know, but the cops wanted him, they made him take them to where, uh, you know, where he stayed at, where he's been staying at, or camping right. in the Up woods. in the woods, yeah. right. Because they wanted to search to see if there were any bodies. You know, okay. they're looking, that's what the cops are looking for. Right. Or for some form of evidence. Right. A- anything to give them a clue because they're still clueless. Now, did they find a clue with this guy? I'm just, I mean, even though he's not the right person, obviously, did they find a clue that way that made it a little bit more interesting? Or Once they searched once all they his searched? stuff yeah. and whatnot? Um, they did not. 
They okay. found they found once again they found nothing. Absolutely nothing. nothing. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So they're still basically at square one. So six months of nothing. All right. Mm-hmm. Then they get word that another woman has been reported missing. All right. Another so one. now um we're at seven. All right, we're at seven. Cops then decide to set up a roadblock. All right. They get this idea that um a few of the prostitutes have been picked up the uh the same area right so the cops got an idea of you know let's set up a roadblock and let's do it in broad daylight okay uh, very interesting broad daylight right because the last two previous prostitutes um were abducted in in daylight right so they figured let's set it up and yeah, let's time set it up it. And, and see right see what happens or see who comes comes rolling through so as they're waiting to see who comes to the area, they notice that Kendall Francois is driving in the area that they're watching. Wow. All right. He set himself up for that one. Right. As he drives away, a citizen runs up to the cops and says that there's some girl who just said that she had gotten raped. Wow. Right. Okay. This woman's name was Kristen Soller. So the cops, they get out, they approach the lady, you know, she's crying, she's she's in, uh, she, you know, shock, right, she's right. angry. She had uh, noticeable bruises on her neck, okay. you know, so Menane had said that you could see the fingerprints on her neck. Damn, um, so he was like, choking like, her out, yeah. Right, right, right. right. Um, as they're trying to talk to her and figure out, you know, what's going on and, and try to get information from her, she wasn't too she she was very hesitant to say anything to the cops she didn't want to she didn't want to so speak to him right out. right but she had thought there was a warrant out for her you know so that's why uh, um she was very hesitant to say anything she right. she didn't want she didn't to give get herself much, up right. right she didn't want to get in trouble so the cops though they persuaded her just to tell them what had happened um they had told her that you know, she she not gonna get in trouble. You know, there's no, and it ended up being that there was no warrant out right, for, for her arrest. anyway. So, right. so she ended up cooperating. She said that it was Kendall Francois. Okay, so she called them so out. She eventually. Called, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and she went on to tell them the story of what had happened. She had said that earlier that day, he had picked her up, brought her back to his house, and um, you know, they did their thing. And when it was time to for him to pay, he became violent, violent. and started wow. choking her. Okay. She was, you know, scared, Sca- beg- of crying, begging, begging him to stop, which eventually he did. He stopped and um they were gonna get up and leave. You know, she mm-hmm. was she was grabbing her her belongings and they were gonna get out the house and he was gonna I guess bring her back bring her to back. the corner right. and whatnot. Oh, so there was some back and forth. She didn't just like run for her life, you know. No, no. Like at once she was pleading, telling him to stop. Wow. He, he stopped. And I would then, have taken off at that point. And then she just yeah. kind of got her stuff, and then he had to bring her back. So Jesus, she was um like while they were in the car, she had kept asking him, just telling him that uh yo, you, can you please stop? I need to get cigarettes. You know, she was she was asking him to just stop the car or whatnot. Okay. So as he was about to pull up to one of the stores or whatnot, she opened up the door and, and, took, and, and off. took off. Well, good for her. Right, yeah, right. for sure. And uh, she ran into the gas station, and that's where the cops were. And this this is the point where, so she had jumped out. She ran into the gas station. That's when the cops see Kendall Francois right. driving through the, right. the roadblock. Right. Looking for her. Right, or leaving because leaving. she had just jumped out of the car. So right. now he's. Probably driving through right, to, to pass the roadblock to get home or whatnot right, or to right, get right. out of there. Right, right, right. Wow, what a story. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty wild. Later that afternoon, um, since the cops already knew that it was Kendall and getting that information, there was an arrest warrant that was issued. And he came in willing, you know, and he admitted to assaulting Kristen Soller. Okay. Um, so he okay. He think that to he it. took the heat off of him, uh, actually killing the other women. He just wanted to admit to this one. Right. Well, she, you know, it just had happened that day and okay. whatnot. And she basically, they saw the cops saw him there. Right. She had said everything. So I mean, there's not too much. So he and he just said, uh, 
that he had did it, that he had, you know, assaulted her and whatnot. That's so, rough. So um, at this point, then the cops tell him that they had uh, a search warrant now for his house. Okay. As soon as they mentioned the search warrant, Kendall Francois's whole persona, everything switched. Wow. So he went from confident to... He became very uneasy. Yeah, there you go. Now, September 1st, 1998 is when he basically admits to everything. Oh, he just gives himself up? He gives himself up. So he cracked under the pressure. He got scared about that search warrant. They uh, once they had told him that, and then he started to get real nervous. He basically gave up right there. So he just gave up on life right there. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I wonder how far, if you could, you know, if I had a chance to ask him or, or to think, like, how far did you or did he think that he was going to be able to go with this? You know, because I mean, eventually mm. it would have ended, right? I mean, mm. eventually you're gonna kill there's gonna be yeah, no more there's gonna be prostitutes no more. Right. or you you know you're gonna die from some form of disease or something right you know? or you die from running away and right you know, i mean eventually it's gonna end it's gonna so, catch so up to you. how long did you really think you know or did he not you <laughs> right 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 right. You're but right. i'm wondering you know how long he thought that this whole thing was gonna go on and play jesus, out you know jesus jesus nah man he uh he got shook and he he admitted to everything. So and he told the cop, uh, he'll tell him everything involving the eight missing prostitutes. Jeez. You know. So then you know the cops are pretty much in shock right, right. now that this dude uh, they've waited. Uh, it's been over a year. A year, right? All Going this, into a second year. All this chaos that has caused the city, you know, and this dude is basically just laying it all laying out for him. So once he says that he'll tell them whatever, they. Bring in a bunch of photos of prostitutes, I guess, that they had on record. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kendall Francois pointed out all the pictures of the prostitutes uh, that he had killed. And so, he, yeah, he remembered them all. He remembered and, and he explained how he killed them. Jesus. So, yeah. Wait, did, he, did he think he was just going to get life or something for doing this? I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, I don't know what he would think. You would think, though, also, too, that people are going to um, push or want that death penalty for sure. Right. If you, you know, you took eight other people's lives. You right. Know? This whole thing, this whole fiasco, it took uh, 22 months to get these answers. Jesus. You know? Just shy um, of two years. And then he basically told them all right there in a matter of seconds. But... You know, you're still, um, everyone's still waiting to hear where the bodies are. You know, right. um, where are he, the he bodies? admitted, you know, of killing now these eight women. He he explained how and whatnot. But now, you know, yeah, what, well, what happened, what happened to, to the him? bodies? Exactly. Right. Kendall then goes on to say that the bodies are in the attic and crawl spaces in his own house where he lives with his mother, father, and sister. <sighs> Which, There's no words for that, bro. Right? That yeah. which is absolutely wild. That's you wouldn't too wild. I, I wouldn't you wouldn't think that. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You would think maybe there was a spot or he was burying, burying them, them somewhere. Right. Tossing or, them over a hill or something. Or exactly. Shoving them into you, some water with an anchor tied to it. Something. Right. Right. Cement shoes. Yeah, cement shoes. But you would not yeah, you would not think that um somebody would be murdering people and leaving their bodies in the house. In the house. And then living a, no- a normal life with a family. Right, right. What kind that's, of nonsense is that? That's crazy. Yeah. So the cops they search the house, right? And um they find decomposing bodies jesus christ did they take it did they take the house apart to do this or was there like a crawl space or something they didn't destroy the house but they had to yeah they had to search everywhere um throughout so yeah throughout the house to find where these um where all these bodies were located right that is Um, insane the crime scene investigation it lasted 29 days all right right, 29 so some bodies were wrapped in plastic. A whole month. All right. All were in different stages of decomposition, which is pretty nasty. So Right, right. Because you remember the first lady, she was like back a long, a long time, time ago, ago, like 20 months ago. Yeah. Wow. 
So one body was found in a large can, and it was so decomposed that the remains, it gelled like a square. It gelled to the shape of the can. The can. Jesus. So, yeah, which is uh, oh no, disgusting. Right, right, right. Another was in a child's waiting pool, just laid there and left decomposing. What? Yeah. They're, the three freshest bodies were in the crawl spaces under the house. Under, oh, my God. And through all this, through this whole situation, and, and even afterwards, Kendall Francois' family members, his mother and father and sister, were clueless of the events that had, had happened been, and, yeah. and taken place. They but didn't, they were living in all that filth, though. Right. They were, yeah, which is disgusting. But I guess the condition of the house and... and the lack of upkeep, um, right. they probably just figured that maybe the smell and the odor came from that, not expecting that it would also be people. That's know, ridiculous, but, man. Yeah. That means it smelled bad enough for them to like just think it was another smell. Yeah. It wasn't even something that was just like uncommon. Right. Wow. Pretty, pretty gross. That's pretty, um, yeah, pretty gross. Yeah, gross is the word for sure. Pretty gross. It. I think, I'm pretty sure that there was... um. I'm sure some form of mental illness that ran through the family. Yeah, I'm pretty sure too. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't see how uh, like a normal human being could could live like that. Right, you know what I'm saying? right. And be Off okay with it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is wild. The prosecution, right? They they wanted the death penalty. They called for yeah, for throw the book ca- at him entirely. Right. But Kendall Francois took the guilty plea. Um, which was uh, life in prison without parole. All right, so that was that was too good for him, right? I mean, he yeah, he pretty much. Um, I mean, in a sense, got lucky. Yeah, he did. He you left know, a with, woman liquefied in a in a tub or, of something. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Gross. No, it was gross. gross. No, they they were too lenient on this man. Yeah. Yeah. What a wild story, though, right? Yeah. Just crazy. How- crazy story, bro. And I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, just to think of, it wasn't some crazy dramatic ending and whatnot, because he ended up just giving giving, up, giving up and turning himself in. But the wild thing is that you know all these events and this, this was a true life story, right? And all these events really happened, so which makes it a very interesting story. Very definitely, um, uh, definitely. Puts Poughkeepsie on the map. Right. I mean, I'm surprised that there's no, if I, unless we don't know about it, I'm surprised there's no uh, like documentary on this. This is documentary material for sure. Yeah. Maybe they will. Maybe someday there will be a cool movie. Someone should. Right. Make a movie Somebody or should. Something. Yeah, that's a hell of a story. It is. It's a, it's a wild story and it's a true life story. Jesus. Which the true life stories are usually what makes the best stories. That's very anyway, true. You know? Yeah. But, um, you have any final thoughts about this? That or? man did not get low. They should have just taken care of your boy. You know, you know what I'm saying? That's too much, man. I mean, I'm thinking about it and I'm just like, yo, they didn't even like, you know, they didn't they didn't love the prostitutes enough. You know, I, I'm not trying to say it in such a bad way, but they're mm-hmm. humans too. Yeah, they're prostitutes, right. but they're humans too. You know what I mean? Let it have been anybody else. You know, it was, that's that was somebody's daughter at the end of the day. Absolutely. Yeah, regardless of what she's doing. Yeah. They, they did not go hard enough on them. So Absolutely. That, yeah, pretty, that's how uh, I feel about it. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Um, I mean, I guess um, people's social status, yeah. I guess, you know, right. like, because everyone's human. Right. And just because someone is out there doing whatever they're doing doesn't make them any, any less. Um, less of a person. Right, you know right. Saying? There's a reason why. Yeah. You know, that yeah. they're that they're everyone does what they do. Of course. So yeah, wild story. Yeah, crazy, wild. crazy events. Um, you know, still to this day too, that um that house, um Kendall Francois's house, um, still stands. Jesus. It's still standing you right knock now. That thing down. <laughs> you gotta knock it down. Somebody's living there? No, nobody's okay. living Good. there. But I do know that um I'm sure that if the house was in livable conditions. Right. 
end if it was for sale, uh, I'm sure that there are quite a few people who would still be very interested in isn't, living there. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> that somebody yeah. would want to live there. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, Before we finish up, though, I just wanted to mention that... Um, so I, I have a coworker whose father worked with Kendall Francois's father. Wow, very back interesting. In the day. Yeah. And um, you know, he didn't know him very well. It's not like that they were friends or whatnot. Right. There were a few little key inside points, you know, that um Oh, they ha- he has, had heard. He has some special insight or something or right. Um so my coworker's father, mm-hmm. all right. He had said in regards about Kendall Francois's father that um, his odor or the smell, his aura was unbearable. Jesus. You know, the yeah. Stank aura. Yeah. And that there was something off or unusual about him. So definitely, like we had said before, like there, there had to have been some form of mental illness. Yeah, definitely had to be. Yeah. Yeah. But they... um. They worked together at a place called DuPont Photo Mask, uh, which was on Route Nine here in okay. Poughkeepsie. Wow, close uh, to home. Re- very yeah. close. Which I don't. I don't believe that this place is still um, called that. The building may still be standing, but um, I, it's not called. It doesn't go by that name anymore. Okay. But um, my coworker's father had said that um, Kendall Francois's father. One thing that stood out. Um, that you would people would be able to know when this man was laughing or found something funny mm-hmm. because he had a very hearty laugh and he would always oh, very slap his knee when he oh, was the laughing. Knee slapper. So, yeah, okay. so he was very loud. That stood out. Quick little story. Uh, so Kendall Francois's father would walk to work every day, right? Okay. And my coworker, his father was driving one day to work and had noticed. Kendall Francois's father uh, walking to work, you know? Right. So, you know, just like uh, any nice person would do. Of course. um, um, Oh, and it happened to be, it was drizzling too. So it was a bit of an atmosphere to that day. Right. It was drizzling. It was wet. It was rainy. So, you know, you didn't want the dude to to walk. Right. So pulled over, um, asked him if he wanted to ride. And yeah, so he picked him up. Um, He brought him to work. And, you know, they went about their day and whatnot. But after that, my coworker's father had said, and I quote, it was the last time because my car stunk for over a week. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> we get him back to that the odor. Smell. Oh, that no. Way. So the smell. So the, that odor the parent, so Oh, with the family smell, the familial smell. Yeah. Jesus. Which is wild, right? That's crazy. That's, even even yeah. the old man. Even the old man, Jesus. I'm sure, which is probably not the best, but no, I, even I'm, worse. I'm sure his mother and the sister, too, probably didn't have, because of the living conditions that right. they chose to live in, <laughs> you know. It's a hell of a condition, rotting bodies and stuff in there, too. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, goodness. So. Shout outs to that person with that story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um actually to both uh both people, individuals who had shared um some yeah, of the man. inside information That's to go crazy. towards this story. We really appreciate that. Yeah, let me ask you a quick question then. Like, uh do you remember it? Cuz I'm not native to Poughkeepsie, but do you remember when that happened where you were? So, unfortunately, um a little wild story. I um for me, I grew up in Newburgh. Okay. Okay. So I wasn't originally from here in Poughkeepsie. Um, so when this had happened, um, being in the nineties, I didn't uh I didn't know when this had gone. I like I didn't hear about okay, it. Okay, you didn't you hear know, about it. Wasn't, it wasn't at all. It wasn't and, and maybe, you know, I'm sure that there was some it was on the news, made the local news and whatnot. So I might have overheard, but it wasn't anything that where I was and in the nineties too, I was still um I was still a kid. You were still a kid, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um hmm. I know that my wife and that um a lot of her friends and whatnot were around here. They grew up around here in Pog- the Poughkeepsie area okay. and they were very familiar and knew and they remember when all this had happened. Right. They were probably so, on the local news and everything, like looking for the next one that gets that got taken. Right, right. Or, you know, got scooped up rather. Scary, scary time and situation to be a female around that time, you know. 
once again, he he wasn't attacking just random females. He he was going after Targeting prostitutes. prostitutes. Okay, so, so he wasn't going after normal right, people or right. kids or anything. But that's still kind of crazy, man. Even like being as a prostitute too. Yeah, you yeah. wonder um, how Especially they working felt. That area. Yeah, how they felt or or their emotions. You know, every day. You know, maybe this could be their last day if right. they came across. Right. Him. Ken, yeah. Right. During that day or what? Or how would they even know? Yeah. 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 Right. Wow. It's a scary time, but all right, my man. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here shortly. Yeah. Sure. But um, before we do that. I want to give a special shout out to a few people. Sure. Um, give a special thanks to our editor, Deirdre. Thank you, Deirdre. We appreciate you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, amazing job. Great As job. Always, great. great job. Um, another special thanks to uh, to our day oneers. As always. Yeah. Shout outs to you. Day oneers out there. God bless you all. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your continued support. You know, we see you and uh, and we love you. We love you a lot. You want to hit them with your social? Yeah. So uh, I got my uh, Twitter and uh, that's Retro Show, S-H-O at the end. Uh, you'll see the Darth Kermit. And for my uh, my Instagram, which I know I should be using more, <laughs> is uh, Tunde, T-U-N-D-E, 2017. All right. And you guys can always find me at uh, Josh underscore Toth3. That is my Instagram. And my Facebook is Joshua Toth. Um, we also remind, uh, remind you guys that uh, to please follow us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Anchor. Please continue to subscribe, share it, yes. comment. Please give us that please. five-star rating. Please give it to us. Yes, please continue to support us and the podcast. God bless. Well, uh, I think that's a wrap, my man. Sounds like a wrap. Great job. Great job. Great episode. Crazy story. Crazy story. Yeah. Wild story. Wild True story. life story. True life story. Local story. Local story. Oh my God. For sure. So, but um, everyone stay safe and uh, and we'll see you all next week. We'll see you next week. All right. Peace. Peace out.